Sorry I couldn't do that one minute. I can put my stand in all your weeks. Congressman Burgess is going to yield his questions to me. You're good. I appreciate it. I was going to do it this morning. The time of 10 o'clock, having arrived, the subcommittee will come to order. The chair will recognize himself for an opening statement. First, I would like to thank Secretary Sebelius for appearing before the subcommittee to discuss the administration's FY 2014 budget request for the Department of Health and Human Services. While the budget request is 65 days late, and both the House and Senate have already passed their respective budget resolutions, it is still important that the country know what the administration's priorities are for the upcoming fiscal year. As implementation of the Affordable Care Act is now a major item in the President's request, this hearing will allow members to ask the Secretary questions about the law on behalf of our constituents. The law is simply not working as advertised. It was sold to the American people as a job creator. The administration put forward an estimate that 4 million jobs would be created. Instead, red tape and a new employer mandate are discouraging companies from creating new full-time jobs. In many instances, workers are seeing their hours cut to part-time or only finding part-time jobs available. Even the Federal Reserve has noted that the uncertainty being created by the law is holding back hiring. I have personally heard from constituents who have been harmed by the mandate. When the government makes it more expensive and more complex to hire workers, companies will hold back on hiring. That's just a simple economic principle. However, that doesn't seem to matter with many government regulators. The law was sold as saving the American people money. Yet today, wherever I go, I hear from individuals and businesses facing insurance premiums that are growing by double digits. <clears throat> now, you may say that this is because everyone is going to have gold standard government-approved insurance. Let, re let me remind you that the American people were told by the President that each family would save $2,500 a year. Now, that wasn't a promise that came with a caveat. In fact, that promise was made with a deadline that it would happen in the first term. That first term is over, and the nonpartisan PolitiFact rates that as a broken promise. Businesses and individuals are seeing their premiums rise as a direct result of the law. I know that some may shake their heads and wonder why Republicans don't just move along and learn to tolerate the ACA. Well, we should not tolerate a government law that makes it harder for our constituents to find and keep a full-time job. Congress should not tolerate regulations that drive up cost for struggling businesses. Finally, we should not stand by and watch Americans with pre-existing conditions be left out of the plan that was intended to give them coverage. I will continue to look for ways to make health care more affordable, more accessible, and simpler for the American people. While it might be best if we could start by repealing the ACA, that law will not stop me and my colleagues from proposing constructive health care reforms. Madam Secretary, we hope that you will stay in order to answer all of our questions. And with only five minutes of questions per member, we ask that you try to keep your answers concise and to the point. The constituents we hear from every day, including those who are able to be here in the audience today, deserve answers. Thank you, and I yield back, and the chair now recognize the ranking member, Ms. Plone, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, and I want to welcome Secretary Sebelius here this morning. Uh, before I address uh, the secretary, though, I do have to say that I, I do um, not appreciate the comments about the ACA. Uh, I know you're saying that you want constructive reforms, but I think that if the mantra of the Republican leadership is going to continue to be that we have to repeal the ACA, it is going to be very difficult in that poisoned atmosphere to talk about constructive reforms. And the fact of the matter is that 
even after the last November election, uh, we continue to hear the Republican leadership, both on the committee as well as in the full House, speak out and say that their priority is repealing the ACA. And of course, we see that in the Ryan budget that passed the House. And um, I would too would like to move towards uh, constructive, reform, uh, constructive reforms in the healthcare system. But this, this constant notion that the priority is to repeal the ACA and that that has to go and you know, that's the most important thing that we have to do for constructive reform. It really does poison the atmosphere and very, make it very difficult for us to sit down on a bipartisan um, level and look at things that we could do together. So I'll just say that. Today we're going to hear about the President's fiscal year 2014 Health and Human Services budget proposal. I want to commend Secretary Sebelius for your agency's hard work this past year to implement the Affordable Care Act. Because of these efforts, Americans are enjoying greater access to health benefits, and I recognize the challenge your agency faces in implementing this law with limited resources. When the Affordable Care Act passed, we did not anticipate that states would give up the opportunity to tailor programs directly to their individual states' needs and opt for federal exchanges. And I regret that my state, New Jersey, is one of the 26 states that will rely on federal exchanges rather than run its own. Uh, again, I think this is pure politics on the part of our Republican governor, but despite this, I urge the administration to remain committed to fully implementing the Affordable Care Act. I was pleased to see the inclusion of increased funding for access to mental health services to protect children and communities in the fiscal year 2014 proposal. I've said before it's time to focus more attention on improving mental health services to make sure troubled kids don't fall through the cracks that fiscal year 2014 budget proposal is an important step towards making mental health issues a national priority and adequately funding these efforts. I also support the uh, FDA's food facility registration inspection fee and the food importer fee included in the administration's proposal. These fees will help ensure that the FDA has the resources needed to fully implement the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act, which of course originated in this committee. Along the same lines, I was pleased to see that the budget proposal includes new user fees to support FDA's cosmetic products program. Cosmetics are used extensively throughout the U.S. by all types of people. And last Congress, I joined with my colleague, uh, Mr. Dingell, to introduce the Cosmetic Safety Enhancement Act of 2012 to help address the lack of authority to FDA to regulate cosmetics. Uh, like the President's budget proposal, our bill included facility registration fees to defray the costs of cosmetic safety activities. So I hope we can work together on modernizing the cosmetic regulations. Uh, before I conclude, I did like to note some concerns. First, I'm disappointed that the funding proposal for the Children's Hospital Graduate Medical Education Program is only $88 million, a two-thirds cut from the fiscal year 12 level. Reducing the federal investment in pediatric training programs will only threaten the pediatric workforce and threaten access to primary care. The small class of hospitals that receive this funding, which includes the Children's Specialized Hospital in my district, represents about 1 percent of hospitals nationwide, but trains approximately 40 percent of all pediatricians. Underfunding this program would have a major negative impact on access to primary care and a devastating impact on access to specialty care for children. And finally, I've long advocated for strengthening Medicare and Social Security, uh, and I am concerned that this budget um, makes some uh, hurtful cuts uh, to the programs. And I really would urge the administration uh, to do what they can to, to strengthen Medicare and Social Security and move away from some of the, uh, the cuts that the President uh, has proposed. Um, but I did want to, I, 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 I do want to, uh, I know we're going to have more questions about the ACA and some of the funding for implementing your outreach. I want to bring that up during my questions and answers. But thank you, Madam Secretary. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. Now recognize the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Chairman Upton, for five minutes for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And knowing that we have votes on the floor in about an hour, uh, I'm going to yield back my time and submit my statement. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes for his opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, despite the fact that we're going to have votes in an hour, I want to make uh, some comments welcoming Secretary Sebelius uh, to our committee. Uh, it's been a year since you've been here, and it's been a very productive uh, and busy year. 
and I want to commend you and your team for your tireless efforts on implementing the Affordable Care Act. It's difficult for most Americans to realize the enormity of the task you, at H you and others at HHS are undertaking to implement this law. But for the millions of uninsured in our country and those for whom insurance fails to provide the security and guarantees that they are looking for, uh, there is certainly appreciation for the uh, difference this law will bring to their lives as they now gain access to health care. The President's budget, which is the topic of today's hearing, includes key proposals to continue the journey forward. Additional funding for CMS to support health insurance marketplaces, building the infrastructure needed to ensure consumer protections and engagement, continuing improvements in Medicare, further investments in the successful health care fraud and abuse control program. The President's budget also expedites the timeline for closing the Medicare Part D donut hole, and a provision that has already brought critical relief, providing $2.7 billion in savings to beneficiaries in 2012 alone. The budget proposal also recaptures rebates for duly eligible seniors, a proposal that I've long supported, enabling us to uh, recover over $120 billion in savings through better drug prices over 10 years. Those are the things that are major pluses, and I support all of those efforts in the President's budget. I'm concerned uh, about some of the proposals that's in the President's budget, such as raising costs of Medicare beneficiaries. I know that this is put in the context uh, offered with, uh, to be part of a broader balanced package that includes both spending cuts and, and increased revenues. However, Medicare beneficiaries have lower incomes than younger Americans, more chronic conditions and health care needs, and pay significantly more out-of-pocket already. It makes little sense to shift more burden onto their backs. Such policies may inadvertently create barriers to appropriate care for vulnerable seniors, and I hope we can continue a dialogue on this is issue. I also have a number of concerns and heard from a number of constituents, both providers and beneficiaries, regarding the dual eligible pilot programs, especially in California. I hope I have your commitment to closely monitor and evaluate these dual demonstrations uh, to assure these demonstrations for dual eligibles to assure protection of our vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities. I appreciate the administration's continuing commitment to public health. Specifically, I applaud the inclusion of the proposal for food safety registration and inspection fees, which will provide much needed resources to support the Food Drug Administration's implementation of the Food Safety Modernization Act of 2011. I hope we can work together to get these critical fees enacted into law. I'm pleased to see a strong investment in biomedical and behavioral research at NIH and continued support for the national HIV AIDS strategy, including through prevention, surveillance, and treatment activities at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Health Resources and Services Administration. The proposals that continue our commitment to community-based pro community primary care, providing additional funding for community health centers, and the Title X Family Planning Program are also important. And finally, as a nation, we are appropriately focusing more of our attention on the impact of gun violence in our communities and the critical importance of promoting mental health and the early detection and treatment of mental illness. I appreciate the President's leadership on this, and I'm pleased that his budget reflects these priorities. By expanding support for gun violence surveillance and research at the CDC and proposing funding for both mental health training in our communities and for additional mental health professionals. I would remiss, be remiss, if, though, if I didn't mention the need to fully implement mental health parity. We are anxiously awaiting the final rule on this important legislation, and I appreciate your assist assistance in securing this. I certainly do appreciate your being here. We look forward to your testimony, and uh, I uh, yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. That concludes the opening statements of the members. Um, thank you. We have one panel today. Our distinguished witness is the Honorable Kathleen Sebelius 
Secretary of Department of Human Health and Human Services. Madam Secretary, welcome again. Thank you for coming today. You will have five minutes to summarize your testimony, and your written testimony will be placed in the record. Please uh, make sure your microphone is on. Please, uh, please speak clearly into it. You may proceed. Well, thank you, Chairman Pitts and Ranking Member Pallone and Chairman Waxman and Ranking Member, I mean, Ranking Member Waxman and um, Chairman Upton for having me here this morning to discuss the President's 2014 budget for the Department of Health and Human Services. This budget supports the overall goals of the President's budget by strengthening our economy and promoting middle-class job growth. It ensures that the American people will continue to benefit from the Affordable Care Act, and it provides much-needed support for mental health services. The Affordable Care Act is already benefiting millions of Americans, and our budget makes sure we can continue to implement the law. By supporting the creation of new health insurance marketplaces, the budget will ensure that starting next January, Americans in every state will be able to get quality health insurance at an affordable price. Our budget also addresses another issue that has been on our minds recently, mental health services and the ongoing epidemic of gun violence. While we know that the vast majority of Americans who struggle with mental illness are not violent, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, recent tragedies have reminded us of the staggering toll that untreated mental illness can take on our society. That's why our budget proposes a major new investment to help ensure that students and young adults get the mental health care they need including training 5,000 mental health professionals to join our behavioral health workforce. Our budget also supports the President's call to provide every child in America with access to high-quality early learning services. It proposes additional investments in new early Head Start child care partnerships, and it provides additional support to raise the quality of child care programs and promote evidence-based home visiting for new parents. Together, these investments will create long-lasting positive outcomes for families and provide huge returns for the children and society at large. Our budget also ensures that America remains a world leader in health innovation. The significant new investments in NIH will lead to new cures and treatments and help create good jobs. Our budget will further provide support for the development and use of compatible electronic health record systems that have huge potential for improving care coordination and public health. Even as the budget invests in the future, it also helps reduce the long-term deficit by making sure that programs like Medicare are put on a more stable fiscal trajectory. Medicare spending per beneficiary grew at just four-tenths of one percent in 2012, thanks in part to the $800 billion in savings already captured in the Affordable Care Act. And the President's 2014 budget would achieve even more savings. For example, the budget will allow low-income Medicare beneficiaries to get their prescription drugs at the lower Medicaid rates, resulting in savings of more than $120 billion over the next 10 years. In total, this budget will generate an additional $371 billion in Medicare savings over the next decade, on top of the savings already in the Affordable Care Act. To that same end, our budget also reflects our commitment to aggressively reducing waste across our department. We are proposing an increase in mandatory funding for our health care fraud and abuse control program an initiative that saved taxpayers nearly $8 for every dollar we spent on it last year. And we're investing in additional efforts to reduce improper payments in Medicare, Medicaid and CHIP, and to strengthen our Office of Inspector General. This all adds up to a budget guided by this administration's North Star of a thriving middle class. It will promote job growth and keep our economy strong in years to come, while also helping to reduce the long-term deficit. Now, I know, Mr. Chairman, that many of you have questions, and I'm happy to take those now. Thank you very much. The Chair thanks the gentlelady for her opening statement. We'll now begin questions from the members, and I will begin the questioning and recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. <clears throat> Madam Secretary, the President promised that the ACA would help make health insurance cheaper for the American people, but 
Unfortunately, exactly the opposite is happening. That's why one of the law's early supporters, the Roofers Union, announced this week that they're now calling for the law's repeal. I, I have a couple of guests here with us today, Sam and Elaine Stoltzfus, our constituents of mine. They're owners of Keystone Wood Specialties in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and their company makes kitchen cabinets and similar wood products. So Sam and Elaine, Elaine welcome. You can identify yourself. Sam recently wrote to me to say, quote, we are faced with a 25 percent increase in health care insurance for our employees and have no idea where the additional $95,000 is coming from. Help, close quote. Madam Secretary, can you tell us this morning what help does the President's budget, either through its implementation of the ACA or other programs, offer to Americans like Sam, and tell us what changes you're proposing in the budget to help Sam. Well, Chairman Pitts, we intend to um, complete the implementation of the Affordable Care Act uh, with the resources requested in this budget. And one of the things that happens is the full implementation includes marketplaces in every state in the country. So small business owners, individuals who purchase health insurance in the individual market will have um, competitive insurance for the first time. Americans with pre-existing health conditions will not be locked out or priced out of the marketplace. And there will be larger risk pools established in every state in the country. Um, as you know, insurance regulation remains under state regulation. We are seeing nationally a trend that has the lowest level of rate increases in the private market that we've seen in over a decade, but the insurance marketplaces are not fully implemented until January of 2014. Madam, Madam Secretary, um, the law passed with a provision designed to help small businesses like Sam's, and I'm talking about the SHOP Act, but there is no funding. There are no funding allocations for it in the President's budget. Will that provision of the law be able to help them come January 1, 2014? Um, yes, yes, sir. I have no idea your constituent size Small or business. what kind of employer market he may be in. But the SHOP Act will be open in every state in, I mean, the SHOP market, excuse me, will be open in every state in January of 2014. Employers will have an option to choose among competitive plans in every state in 2014. Madam Secretary, did not you recently announce a delay for implementation of the exchanges for small business till 2015? No, sir. What, we, what, did you, what did you do? In the federal marketplaces, in the states where we will be running the market, the portion of the shop market that will be delayed one year are employers being able to offer their employees multiple plans to choose from. Every employer will be able to choose from a variety of plans and offer the plan of his or her choice to those employees. And the employers who qualify for the tax credit because of the size of their workforce and the level of um, the employee's income will also get a tax credit in the shop market. Right, but it Matt. won't be until year two that that wider employee choice will be available. Only in the federally facilitated marketplaces. States may offer it uh, starting in 2014. Madam Secretary, um, I also hear from constituents who are being hurt by the ACA uh, two or three times a week. Mostly I hear from constituents who've had their work hours cut as companies try to avoid skyrocketing costs imposed by the law. Just yesterday it was reported that a national movie chain with theaters in my district has cut some employees' hours as they struggle to provide insurance for full-time employees. And right now, there are fewer Americans working than at any time since 1979. And my constituents are looking for full-time jobs, but the ACA is making those jobs harder to come by. I've, I've had another constituent from Lancaster County who wrote recently saying he retired last year after 26 years as a police officer, but still needs to work, and his hours have been cut. He can now only work three and a half days a week. Uh, basically, he's saying, and this is his quote, Obamacare limits me to working 29, or, uh, 29 hours a week. Tell us, what help the uh, President's FY14 proposal provides this man? Well, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any idea why the employers have restricted hours. There is absolutely nothing 
in place in the Affordable Care Act in the year 2013 that would um, impose any burden on an employer or have him cut work hours. Uh, what we know is in 2014, um, there will be a new market set up and a employer responsibility. Employers who have 50 or more full-time workers, or the equivalent of 50 or more full-time workers, uh, will be responsible for offering health insurance to those employees. And what we know, Mr. Chairman, is that 94% of employers in that market right now offer health insurance, but often pay 18 to 20% more than their large competitors because they are in a very volatile and very expensive market. Creating competitive options and choices for those employers is part of what the Affordable Care Act is all Thank about. Thank you, Madam, Madam Secretary. My time's expired. Chair Re recognizes the ranking member Mr. Plown, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but with all respect, you know, the Republican leadership on the committee as well as in the House just rapidly attacks the ACA every day. It's going on for three years, actively trying to defund or undermine its implementation uh, the chairman is asking questions about no funding in the, for small businesses and the health exchange, but is the Republican leadership willing to fund any of these things? I mean, I'd be glad to provide more funding in the budget or, the, or through the appropriations process for implementation, but I, I don't believe for one minute I would get any support from, from the GOP. So, you know, it is, it's a little, dis <laughs> you know, it's a little uh, crazy to come here and say we should repeal the ACA, we should defund the ACA, we should get rid of this and get rid of that, and then at the same time say, oh, well, we, you know, you're not implementing because you're not providing enough funding. I mean, the same thing with jobs. I mean, we're, GOP is saying, oh, uh, you know, uh, there aren't any jobs. Well, there are, you, the sequester, which the president keeps putting out proposals every day to try to eliminate and, 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 and have this some sort of sensible budget proposals here, um, is, is, is furloughing people left and right. I mean, it, all in my district, I don't care where it is, whatever, it's not just uh, uh, public jobs, it's, it's in, having impact on the private sector as well. So you, you can't come in here and say, oh, you know, people are working part time. Meanwhile, you, you support a sequester that furloughs people all across the country, tens or hundreds of thousands of people. Whatever. Uh, if, you know, some Republicans, now, of course, they're talking about the marketplaces and the exchanges won't be ready in time. And so I wanted you to talk, if you could, about the status of implementation of the exchanges, which is on everybody's mind, and, uh, you know, give you a, a chance to update what the progress you're making towards setting up the exchanges uh, and implementing them. But again, if you'd like to comment on the fact that Congress is not providing enough funding for outreach, States like New Jersey that rely on federal exchanges are, are not, are, may get even less funding. So please don't hesitate to say that, you know, that if you're going to do outreach and implement these things, that you need money that we're not giving you because we're not. I mean, I, that's, that's the reality. But whatever, Madam Secretary, I'm obviously very frustrated. Go ahead. Well, Congressman, the um, budget before you has a, a request for an additional $1.5 billion in um, implementation funding to fully set up marketplaces throughout the country. We are definitely um, going to be open for open enrollment in every state in the country starting October 1st of 2013, and we will be um, beginning plan years and benefit years for individuals uh, who currently either don't have insurance or have um, expensive insurance or are locked out or priced out of the marketplace because of pre-existing conditions starting in January 2014. We're very pleased that 31 states in the District of Columbia are running all or part of their partnership programs, um, marketplaces either in partnership with HHS or doing it on their own. Uh, in the other states where uh, the states had opted not to be engaged or involved, we will be running the marketplaces. We are setting up, as we speak, the, the federal hub with a call center and outreach. Um, the resources that we had hoped to get in the continuing resolution deal with outreach and education, uh, a huge issue for people to actually understand what the reality is of the law, what benefits are coming their way, what kind of choices they will have. 
uh, but we have reallocated um, some resources within the department and fully intend to give people the information and the facts about the law as we move forward. Well, I just, you look, I, I think it's highly unlikely that the House Republicans are going to give you this money for outreach that you're asking for. But again, they can't come back here and criticize uh, if the outreach doesn't occur if they're not funding it. Uh, let me ask a question about the um, GHGME, the Children's Hospital Graduate Medical Program. I see that the White House is proposing $88 million, which is one-third of current funding. I don't think that's a good idea given the struggles these hospitals have to train enough pediatricians. Uh, wouldn't scaling back that program take us back to the same flawed system we had in the past? And why would the administration seek to reverse uh, the success we've had in this area? If you'd comment. You know, I always ask you about this. And you don't have a lot of time here. <laughs> Congressman, the funding level um, recognizes the direct costs of training pediatricians, an incredibly important task that a lot of children's hospitals engage in. What we don't have is the overhead and administrative costs as part of that proposal. And in a better budget time, we would have included both. But all of the direct costs of the residency programs are included in that budget recommendation. Well, I'm just hoping that we, on a bipartisan basis, Mr. Chairman, can address that, because I do think that that's one thing where Democrats and Republicans can come together to avoid that cut. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Now recognize the Vice Chairman of the. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the. Uh, chairman Emeritus uh, of the Committee, Mr. Barton, five minutes for questions. I thank the Chairman. I want to apologize to the uh, Chairman and the Ranking Member and our esteemed witness for not being here to hear the opening testimony. We're always honored to have you, Madam Secretary, and. We look forward to the dialogue. My um, staff and the committee staff encouraged me to tweet and ask the American people um, for a question or two to ask you. I guess they decided that I wasn't up to it. I'm not sure. But in any event, we did it. And these are quest two questions from real people who I don't know. We just, we had in the neighborhood of 100 tweet questions come back in. So uh, in the interest of transparency, uh, we thought we'd give the American people a, an opportunity to ask you a direct question or two. The first one is um, a, a tweeter named at uh, Josh Mertz. And his question is, I assume it's a he, how is the typical small business going to be able to comply with the thousands of pages of new regulations that Obamacare requires? Where are these business owners going to find the money to pay for the compliance? Uh, many of them have expressed how they'll have to hire new administrative personnel and spend countless hours with their attorneys figuring out just what they have to do. This is from uh, at Josh Mertz. Do you want me to take that and then ask the second one, or do you want to give Well, let's give you a chance to answer that one, and, and then we'll hold the second one uh, in, you know, in uh, reserve. Well, Congressman, the um, small business owner, um, tweeter, welcome to Twitter land. Um, I'm, I'm a new tweeter myself. Um, but depending on the size of uh, this small business, uh, the law may or may not impact the business at all. So if this employer has fewer than 50 full-time or the equivalent of 50 full-time employees, um, there is absolutely no impact except for the fact that in the shop exchange, in the shop market, he, if he wants to provide health insurance for his employees, will have an opportunity to have some competitive plans, let's, a let's one-stop assume, shop, and go forward. Let's assume they're just over that limit. And if he falls into the over 50 full-time equivalent, there will be, for the first time ever, again, a one-stop shop coming in through a website. He will not have to hire an administrative personnel. He'll be able to determine uh, from a choice of plans, what plan is best suited to his employees, offer that to his employees, 
and if he indeed qualifies for a tax credit, depending on the wages of those employees, that will automatically be part of the package moving forward. So your basic answer is there, he's not going to have any compliance cost. Apparently. Well, depending on, um, I mean, there are no additional forms and things to fill out. The, the goal is really to make this as seamless as possible for small business owners and for individuals so that their experience uh, is um, relatively simple as they come into the market. Okay. Well, let me go to the second one. And you'll know that I don't know this person when I give the, the – Name. It's Eric the Banker at Yankees Fanatic Six. <laughs> and I'm a Ranger and Astro fan, so there's no way I know this guy. <laughs> How does the Obama administration justify the rising cost of health care, including rising premiums and a reduction in work hours, even before Obamacare is fully in effect, even though President Obama and your department specifically promised that premiums would, would not rise and health care costs would go down. So his basic question is how do you justify, in spite of what was said before the fact, that the rising cost of health care, uh, including rising premiums, uh, are going up? Well, as I said to the chairman um, a few minutes ago, uh, first of all, the Increases in private health insurance are at a slower pace than we have seen in well over a decade over the last three years, and that has been documented. The other kind of good news is that there finally is some stability in the small employer marketplace who were shedding policies prior to the passage of the ACA for well over a decade. So that has, has stabilized, and there is nothing in place right now in – the legislation that would um, require any employer to change work hours. Um, and we don't think there's going but to be you, a work hour. I, so what's ever happening to work hours, I think, is um, impossible to tie to the Affordable Care Act because there is no connection here in 2013. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. I hope the two tweeters that we used uh, we'll tweet some more questions. Uh, I think it's good to give the public a chance. And I do want to compliment you, Madam Secretary, for coming before the committee. I know it's difficult and your time's limited, but we do appreciate you coming. With that, Mr. Chairman, Thank I Chair, thanks, the gentleman. <clears throat> now recognize the, uh, recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, it's a tweet to have you here. And, uh, <laughs> And oh, I, that is so bad. That is terrible. <laughs> Wait till you hear my questions. <laughs> that was the high point of my five minutes. The Republicans fought against the Affordable Care Act. In fact, Republicans fought against Medicare, but they certainly hated the Affordable Care Act. I never could understand that because it was based on a lot of Republican principles, proposals that Senator Dole and others had put forward. And they would love to repeal it. Uh, they would have liked the Supreme Court to throw it out. They would have liked the, the election to go otherwise. And so they're making life as difficult as possible for you in uh, moving forward to implement the law. But I'd just like to ask you, what would the world be like for health insurance if we let the insurance companies be in charge? Because that's what the Republicans would have if they repealed the Affordable Care Act. Insurance companies are businesses, and for them, it's better to get healthier insured patients than the sickest. So they, they, they try to exclude people who are sick. If you've got a pre-existing condition, they don't want you. They can discriminate against you. They can charge you a lot more. In fact, if you're a woman, they think just being a woman is a pre-existing condition. And I am. <laughs> Uh, that's almost as bad as my comment. <laughs> uh, so they would allow uh, insurance companies to discriminate against people they, don't, they look at as maybe costing them money. And then not only that, um, they would raise the rates if you got sick. They could drop you. They have these rescissions that they were doing. They have all sorts of ways of making it difficult for people who are not just healthy enough to... Uh, uh, to, to cover. So um, tell us, what would happen to American families, consumers, seniors, 
particularly those with pre-existing conditions, if Republicans repeal health reform and put insurance companies back in charge? Well, Congressman, as you know, I um, served for eight years as the elected insurance commissioner in Kansas and have worked on the insurance side of this puzzle for a long time. And what I saw and what we continued to see, frankly, until 2010 was, um, from the industry point of view, a, a death spiral. That's the terminology used by insurers, which means they had fewer and fewer customers and the prices continued to rise because the people who stayed in the marketplace were older and sicker and needed the coverage. The people who dropped out were younger and healthier. So we this really can't decades. blame, you can't blame the insurance companies. They're, they're, they're in business to make a profit. But, well, and they, but it's they a real were problem for people. Experiencing or consumers were experiencing double digit rate increases year in and year out in that market and being locked out and priced out if you had a pre-existing condition. I want to uh, move uh, uh, forward because there, there's some other questions and I'm looking at the clock tick by. Uh, there's a prevention public health fund that we set up in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, this, this fund is, uh, is, is there to help uh, fund a lot of important efforts to keep people well and yet there's been an ongoing attack on it since its creation. The Republicans have sought to uh, repeal, rob and otherwise destroy this fund. Just yesterday, our committee, Repub uh, in this committee, Republicans argued the fund is merely a slush fund. Its resources are being used inappropriately to pay for public health lobbying efforts, for example. That the Obama administration itself is guilty of stealing from the fund to support activities related to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. And in brief, they contend that the fund is not being used as intended and therefore should be available to support other worthy health-related initiatives, such as an extension of the uh, PCI pro PCIP program. Uh, I'd like uh, you to take this opportunity to set the record straight on exactly how the prevention fund is and isn't being used, and why we need it, even though you had to borrow money from it because the Republicans wouldn't give uh, the administration the funds to go forward and implement, fully implement the uh, Affordable Care Act. Well, Congressman, I think there's a great track record so far with the prevention fund. The first time ever in the United States that we have focused um, some serious dollars on preventing people from getting sick in the first place. Um, a great track record on our anti-tobacco efforts, uh, quit lines around the country, uh, smoking cessation efforts, and those are beginning to show up in the drop in smokers, work on chronic disease in communities continues. Um, and you're right, we did uh, this year appropriate about $340 million from the Prevention Fund for 2013 to outreach and education around the Affordable Care Act. In the long run, that will ensure that lots of Americans who currently have no primary health home, who have no insurance coverage, who have no ability to get preventive care will indeed be connected with the benefits of the Affordable Care Act. Well, nothing's more important than preventing disease and pro promoting good public health, and I hope this fund can be used for the purpose of which it was intended. The gentleman's Thank time you. has expired. Chair, Chair thanks the gentleman. Now recognize the Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee, Dr. Burgess, five minutes for question. I thank the Chairman for the recognition. Let me just start off, and it's been a tough morning. We all acknowledge the, uh, that our friends and neighbors down in the town of West Texas, just 100 miles north of Waco, are suffering this morning as they dig out from under the uh, that rather horrific explosion that occurred last night. So as we continue to play, pray for the people in Boston, we, we also need to pray for the citizens of West. Now, Madam Secretary, um, I also appreciate you being here. I guess it's been almost a year since we've had an opportunity to talk. It's been too long. Please come back to our committee frequently. In fact, I would recommend to the chairman that we do have frequent visits because, as you know, October 1st becomes a very first, a very important day in the history of our country where your exchanges are going to go live online by statute. They're to go live online on October 1st. And I guess the question on everyone's mind this morning is, will you be ready? Yes, sir. And the exchanges okay, won't yes. be October 1st. Open enrollment will open. start October 1st. The exchanges will be up and running on January 1st. Open enrollment. Yes. Now, I do have to ask you a question about the, about the prevention fund. Um, I had difficulty finding that in your, in your budget and the expected outlays for the prevention fund. 
but it's, it's written in statute. It's in the, it's in the uh, uh, so-called Affordable Care Act, Section 4002, and it lays out the monies that will be available for successive fiscal years up to fiscal year 2014, uh, where it's $1.5 billion, and then for 2015 and every year thereafter, it's $2 billion. So it's a significant amount of money even in Washington, D.C. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. And you have pretty broad transfer authority within that fund. Is that not correct? Transfer authority within the fund? That's what it says, I subsection D, transfer authority. Uh, that the transfer of funds in the fund to, to be a, for eligible activities under this section subject to subsection C, which delineated the activities you could fund and the, some of one you of those can activities. You spend funds within the fund, if that's what you're asking, yes, sir. Yes, you can transfer yeah. funds to spend for education and outreach, for example. Education and outreach is going to be a big part of what happens with the yes. Affordable Care Act this summer, is it not? Yes. So in other words, to implement the Affordable Care Act, you're going to take funds from the Prevention Fund for advertising for the, the, the benefits of the Elysian Fields of Obamacare that start this fall. Is that not correct? We are going to uh, reach out to people who currently have no health insurance and who are underinsured or uninsured and inform them about the benefits of the act and connect them and how much, with the act. How much yes. money are you going to spend on that informing activity? Um, sir, we transferred about $332 million from the prevention fund to be used for outreach activities. And this is an important point, and I want people who are watching to understand this. The prevention fund actually is a, it's like a, a bank book that you can use and take with, make a withdrawal to pay for advertising to advertise about the Affordable Care Act. Sir, Correct. we're not talking about advertising. We recently put out, for instance, a grant uh, that will be available to community organizations, faith-based groups, provider groups in states around the country yeah. so that they will actually work. I don't know if you're familiar with the Senior Health Insurance Patrol Program. Re reclaiming my time just briefly because our, our time is limited. Ground. And we, we do need to talk about these people who were the, the pre-existing condition program, which which unfortunately ended. And Chairman Pitts had a It hasn't your, ended, sir. Well, it enrollment is. has been suspended. That's correct. We are. So Chairman is. Pitts has a, a hearing, and we hear from a young woman who is a lawyer in private practice, unfortunately contracted lymphoma. She's been paying her claims as best she can, waiting to fulfill the six-month uninsured requirement to get into the pre-existing condition program. And the day before she's to enroll, uh, she's told, sorry, sister, we're, we're now closed. So is it Obamacare or Obama don't care? Tell me which it is. Well, for the individual you're talking about, the good news for her and millions of Americans is that beginning July, January 1st, 2014, no American ever again will be locked out of an insurance pool because of a pre-existing health so condition. Here, and that will benefit millions of people, including the woman that you've discussed. Here is the question. Rather than spend the money on advertising for a program that may not even work come October 1st or January 1st, why should we not transfer money from that fund to actually help the people that you promised to help, the people with pre-existing conditions? Well, sir, the pre-existing condition pool, as you know, was already always designed to be a temporary bridge to full insurance coverage. What I hear from people all over this country is they are eager for the day when the rules will change once and for all for insurance companies. They will never again be able to lock anyone out because of a pre-existing health condition. And that's and very different from segregating them into a high-risk pool, which most people cannot afford. But the important thing is that this individual and many individuals like her are essentially lost at sea until January 1st at the very least. And we, have the, ability, the is and we have the ability sight. to prevent that from happening, which would be the prevention fund. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. <clears throat> now recognizes the uh, ranking member, Emeritus, Mr. Dingell, five minutes for questions. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your courtesy. Madam Secretary, thank you for being here today to talk to the committee about the administration's 2014 budget. I want to take a moment to thank you for the fine work you've been doing to implement the Affordable Care Act in the face of some rather nasty opposition by all kinds of folks, including some members of this committee. You and your staff have worked tirelessly to implement health reform, a historic undertaking. 
and I look forward to continuing to work with you as this process continues. I also like to note that uh, you are the daughter of a former member of this committee and uh, you are always welcome. I'm sure you view this as something of a home to you. So welcome. Thank you. In any event, Madam Secretary, yes or no questions. Uh, you are working now on the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act. The legislation made historic improvements in our food safety system and provided new authorities to help FDA to prevent food safety problems before they occur throughout the food supply. This legislation, which I authored, included a dedicated source of funding for the implementation of food safety through a facility fee, a reinspection and recall fee, and a fee for importers and exporters. Unfortunately, some of our friends on the other side of the Capitol did not see the wisdom of the fees, but they passed overwhelmingly here in the House. The President's fiscal 2014 budget requests $225 million in resources through fees to help the fund the implementation of the food safety law. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, these proposed fees include a food facility registration and inspection fee and a food importer fee. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Madam Secretary, can you explain briefly what these activities and these fees will be used for? Well, there's no question that in the 70 years um, between the time that Congress passed the new food safety um, measure a few years ago and the last time uh, food safety measures were updated, that the market has changed dramatically. We have a global market. About half of our fruits and vegetables and two-thirds of our seafood come in from overseas. We have a different kind of... Huge imports uh, occupy a very high proportion of American consumption. Yes, sir. And we're finding that that seems to be about the only way we can get the FDA properly funded to carry out its missions. Is that right? They definitely need new resources to build a new food safety system. Particularly in the area of new drug approvals. Is that right? That's correct. Now, Madam Secretary, do you believe these fees help FDA to implement the food safety law effectively and in a timely manner? Yes or no? I do. Another area of interest to me is cosmetics. FDA's authorities over this industry are woefully outdated. The industry itself has requested improved authority for the FDA in this area to better ensure the safety of cosmetics. And I note the industry has requested this to their great and lasting credit. The administration has proposed a cosmetic user fee of $19 million. Is this correct? Yes, sir. Madam Secretary, can you explain the fees, uh, purposes, and the activities that this user fee uh, will be used to support? Again, it will be used to really um, update the regulatory capacity and add new technical expertise. At, as you say, it's requested by the cosmetics industry, so we're very hopeful to work with Congress on implementing this update to the Reinventing Cosmetic Fee Initiative. Now, Madam Secretary, uh, this business of fees for FDA began when this committee worked out a deal with the uh, pharmaceutical industry to enable the pharmaceutical industry to get better service from FDA on new drug applications. Is that right? New drug applications and new device applications, yes. Sir. And, and, well, actually, it's moved through new drug, new devices, over-the-counter, and all kinds of things. Yes. Uh, and that has worked out very, very well from the standpoint of industry and from the standpoint of government and consumers. Is that it right? It has definitely expedited the ability to um, put things on the market more quickly. And it's, it's actively supported by the industry. Yes, sir. And prior to the time of that legislation, it is interesting to note that food and drug would take as much as 10 years of the 17-year period on the patent, the end result of which was that uh, the industry lost hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars. People were denied the availability of useful new pharmaceuticals which could help deal with some of the serious medical and health problems of the country. Is that right? That's correct. We were losing to global competitors because of the pace of approvals. Madam Secretary, thank you for being here. Good luck in implementing the legislation that is so important to the Affordable Care Act. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Dr. Murphy, five minutes for questions. He's out. Dr. Gingrey. Out. 
Oh, okay, Dr. Murphy, you're here. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, I appreciate you being here today. I have a, first of all, a question. Um, and I recognize in your position you may not get the letters that we send over, but there was a bipartisan letter sent to your office signed by uh, myself, uh, Chairman Upton, uh, Ranking Member Waxman, uh, Diana Deget, and others regarding a follow-up on a number of mental health issues uh, on some of the issues. I'm not sure if you saw that, but we had asked for a response in February. We have not received a response yet. I brought another copy here. Can I get that to you? And yes, sir. You can write to your desk. I appreciate that. It is important as we make sure. And I appreciate your focus on mental health. I'm a psychologist myself. Uh, I also know in your statements you had requested some funding increases in a number of areas. Another thing, and I hope you can take this to uh, message to the President as well, is I have reviewed or tried to review what the federal government spends on mental health in a wide range of areas, in HHS, in judiciary, education, um, Department of Defense, the Veterans Administration. It appears that no one has a handle on how much money we spend in mental health services in a, in a broad perspective. No one's ever done an inventory in that. So uh, we also send a letter over, uh, Representative DeGett and I sent a letter over to uh, the Office of Management and Budget with a copy to the President uh, asking for an inventory of all that we do. And I think that'd be important because we need to know how much we spend, where we spend it, and following that, is it even effective, such as um, does it get to the level of the patient? When you're talking about one in five people at any given time have a mental health disorder, and that perhaps only 40% of those with mental illness get treatment, that we heard uh, before during a hearing we did at Post Newtown from the head of NIMH, that people, it's about 112 weeks before someone even gets treatment for a psychotic disorder, and you pointed also out in your testimony it's about ages 14 to 25 when some of these disorders appear and that every one of these uh, uh, mass murders was generally in that age range. I think all but one was male, um, psychotic symptoms and other things. We recognize mental illness, severe mental illness. They're not all violent. The vast majority are not. But it is an area that we're all deeply concerned. We need to know what we're doing and are we doing the right thing. And so will you be able to get us a response to that letter? Uh, um, yes, sir, we will definitely. Thank you. Um, another issue has to do with mental health parity. Uh, that bill was passed over four years ago, and we still have not seen regulations. Do we have a date yet by which we might see something? We are committed to um, finalizing the rule this year and are in the process of doing just that. We do have interim final rules that are, um, have been promulgated um, two years ago, and so that, those are in place right now. Thank you. Uh, in another area, uh, we were talking a little bit about the FDA here. Um, I noticed recently a uh, substance by the name of JACT, with a three, backwards three in there for the letter E, was recently put out uh, as a ban because some substance within it was perhaps associated with, we don't have a direct link, but perhaps correlated with a couple of deaths. I know the military has asked that all these products be removed from commissaries and exchanges on military basis. Um, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at this, but my question is, are these products still being sold online or in stores? And if you could get back to me with information on that, because I recognize we don't want a dangerous or potentially dangerous substance out there for people taking these. And another area I wanted to bring to your attention, too, in terms of supplements, uh, the December issue, I think it was military medicine, said that with regard to supplements, they did a survey of supplements sold on military basis. They found that only 12 percent of manufactured um, supplements actually had an independent body ver verify what is in it. We've seen studies that say even vitamin D content and vitamin pills may range from less than 10 percent of what it's supposed to have to 140 percent of what it's supposed to have. Uh, so 12 percent have an independent uh, verifier. About 28 percent verify themselves, the content, whatever that is, a mineral, a supplement, a vitamin, and the rest, 60 percent, have nobody verifying at all what is in there. Um, somewhere within your agency, I'm sure someone is taking a look at that, and I would appreciate information back on that. I mean, it's a, it's a massive industry in America, geared to help people stay healthy. We want people to stay healthy. 
but I sure would like to know what's in that. Well, Congressman, I can tell you we would love to work with you around that issue. Um, a lot of these uh, supplement additives uh, fall into a very gray area where they are not sold as medical products. Uh, they are not sold as pharmaceuticals. They are not, um, they're, they're sort of food additives. Mm -hmm. And that often is kind of outside the FDA jurisdiction. But we would, we would love to pursue that issue with you. Thank you. I look forward to meeting with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Capps, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Madam Secretary. As you know, my state of California has consistently taken a leadership role and health reform implementation. And now I've heard concern from hospitals in my district about the financial impact of the disproportionate share hospital, the DISH program cuts and reductions on the providers who are in states like California making a good faith effort to implement the Affordable Care Act. Could you speak to the proposed DISH reduction schedule and how this proposal will help facilitate a smooth transition of full ACA implementation? Um, Congresswoman, we were hearing similar reports from um, hospital executives uh, around the country. And in the midst of um, an attempt to really fully engage in the, in the health market, so the determination um, that we have made recently is that the Medicare cuts, which have a specific timeline around DISH, will proceed uh, with implementation in 2014. We are committed to fully reducing DISH payments by the amount suggested in the ACA schedule, but not beginning the Medicaid DISH reductions until 2015. Okay. When DISH cuts are set to take effect, how is CMS going to recalculate the hospital need for the funds? Uh, will hospitals in states like California, where we are embracing a Medicaid expansion, have a fair shot at the funds went up against the non -ex In other words, do we get our fair share? <laughs> Thank you. Well, and the goal, as you know, um, when you authored or helped to author the Affordable Care Act, is that as additional Americans um, were able to be covered by health insurance <laughs> or by Medicaid expansion, that would reduce the level of uncompensated care that hospitals currently experience. So it's, it's designed to um, be a compliment, but we um, are conscious of the notion that that won't be a, a direct match, and we're looking very carefully and doing a lot of outreach about what is the most effective way to implement the cuts that are proposed in the law. Well, I appreciate that and, and your willingness to do all you can to ensure a smooth transition as the ACA goes into full effect. We want to be partners with you. And I want to highlight, however, that we're watching carefully. It would be unfair if states that are acting in good faith, like California, are harmed because of other states' policies. And I'm sure you're aware of that, and I know you're going to keep uh, that in mind. One last question. This delay in dish reductions is just a proposal, right? It's proposed in the budget this right. year. Right. Yes. A proposal. I, I just think this I knew is it was important. Proposed. I just wanted to make sure who. Exactly. Was. I just wanted to make. Um, the, this is an important distinction. I believe as uh, uh, implementation continues to be hampered by politics. Yes. Some governors are using the proposed delay in dish cuts as an excuse to delay making decision on Medicaid expansion. I think this is irresponsible and pretty cruel to constituents. Um, anyway, I, 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 I believe the cut delays are not just a proposal, but the impact and the impact of delaying the decisions is not. But I, I want to use uh, there's a minute, a little over a minute left, because I'm such a, as someone who was a for, what, formerly a visiting nurse myself, uh, I believe the uh, the renewed commitment to maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting programs is just excellent and a good preventive and cost-saving way to deliver health uh, services. It's by, the evidence is bipartisan, uh, and these, and it's evidence-based that these programs work and they're critical in, to improving health outcomes for women and children and really for families. Uh, could you detail over the proposed investment in these programs over the next 10 years? Just, and there's not much time to do it, but uh, highlight it so we can follow up. Well, I think one of the very exciting second-term initiatives that the President believes in very strongly is a, an infrastructure around early childhood um, starts. So it uh, includes health and human services, um, 
increases in investments in um, home visiting programs, which as you say are evidence-based and not only are um, wonderful for health, but also very proven to reduce violence <laughs> and, and be um, a great strategy for resilience in children, uh, increases in our early Head Start child care partnership effort, mm -hmm. and then um, in the Department of Education budget is a significant increase in pre-K programs uh, in partnership with states around the country. And that infrastructure to make sure that by the time children are five and hit school, they are not only ready to learn, but they are socially and emotionally um, ready to be in a classroom, we see as a critically important investment to make in the future. Thank you. And this really gets at our disparities in health care as yes. well. Thank you. In a very clear <laughs> way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, sure, thanks, General Lady. And I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Gingrey. Five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, as one of the physician members of the committee, you know I've always been unwavering in my commitment to the full repeal of Obamacare. Uh, but now as we approach full implementation, however, I believe that we must chip away at the most egregious parts of the law. And to that point, Secretary Sebelius, you stated in a speech uh, in Philadelphia in late March of this year that some men and younger customers could see their insurance rates increase because of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Do you think that it is fair that young people will pay higher insurance rates because of this law? Sir, I think we don't know what the rates will look like until the insurers file their plans. And the very good news is that state insurance departments around the country have additional resources to review those. Well, let me, the, the, let me make sure in the interest of time, I'm asking you a simple question. Do you think that it is fair that Obamacare asks young people to pay higher insurance rates? I know you don't know what they'll be, but is it fair? Do you think it's fair? Well, there's nothing in the law that asks young people to pay higher rates. Well, Secretary Sebelius, uh, actuarian uh, Oliver Wyman's firm produced a study uh, that identified how wealthy a young person had to be before their health costs went up because of Obamacare. Uh, I ask you this. Do you happen to know how wealthy a young person in 2014, when you fu fully implemented these exchanges, will have to be, how wealthy that person would have to be to not pay higher out-of-pocket insurance premiums? Um, well, let me, that's I'll, let me, a possible let me, question, let me, but we, what we know about young people right now who are not insured, um, a number of them are on their parents' plans until age 20. Well, we're talking and about assume that this person is 27 years old. Then anyone under 400 percent of poverty will qualify for a tax subsidy, an upfront tax subsidy, and will have insurance policies with far lower co-pays and co-insurance. Well, the answer, right the answer now, according so the answer, pocket. Madam Secretary, the answer according to this actuarial study is $25,000. Secretary Sebelius, do you think that asking a young young person who makes $25,500 to pay more for their insurance under Obamacare, is that fair? Well, that isn't accurate. Unfortunately, the um, somebody who's making $25,500 would definitely qualify for a subsidy if he or she is purchasing coverage in the individual market, so they will not pay more out of pocket than they I don't know how much that less. subsidy might be, Madam Secretary, but even with the subsidy, uh, they will be paying more under Obamacare than they would be paying four years ago for the same insurance coverage. That, that is absolutely not That is absolutely true. And let, let, me, let me ask you that, Madam Secretary, let, let me ask you this ne uh, next question. Has your department created contingency plans in the event, in the event that young people, uh, like I just described, choose to pay the penalty instead of purchasing insurance that they can't afford? Have you developed a contingency plan in the event that that occurs? Uh, no, sir. We intend to implement the law, but I think educating young people about what options they will have that they do not have now, that they will be in a larger pool, that there are subsidies available to them which they absolutely do not know, and that they will have 
full insurance coverage, yeah. young women know that no longer will it be legal for an insurance company to charge 50 or 75 percent more for exactly the same coverage. And we're well, I only mentioned I only mentioned young men because that was who you addressed in that speech in Philadelphia. And, and look, you're a lot more optimistic, obviously, about how this is going to work uh, in these exchanges in, in uh, January 1 of 2014 than I am. But I would I would recommend uh, highly recommend to you, Madam Secretary, that you do develop a contingency plan. Uh, in the event that so many of these young people look at that and say, hey, look, uh, here I am straight out of college. Uh, I'm now 27, so I'm not on my, my parents' uh, policy. And furthermore, they kicked me out of the basement. Uh, I've got $250,000 worth of higher education debt. I, I'm engaged. I'm trying to build a life. I've got a job. Uh, I, I strongly suggest that, that your department uh, create this contingency plan, uh, and I would suggest that you submit that to me and to, the, and to this committee, and furthermore, not let a train wreck or any other excuse slow it down. And I yield back the balance of my time. Sure, well, Congressman, you, the other thing that's available to your young person who is engaged is a uh, choice of a fully insured plan or a catastrophic plan. Uh, what we know is putting that young person in a large pool uh, automatically by entering the marketplace will be significantly more beneficial than he or she shopping in the individual market where they have no rules and no protection. And if indeed they get any kind of pre-existing condition, they could be booted out in a heartbeat. So well, Mr. Chairman, you, uh, since you let her go a little bit over with, just let me just say, uh, address the issue of age banding where you're going, because of your rules, you're going to force these young people to pay higher rates than somebody 58 years old who can well afford to pay uh, better than they can, and you ought to let the states decide that. And gentleman's time government. has expired. Uh, chair, recognize the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Matheson, five minutes of question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Madam Secretary, thanks for coming before the committee today. Um, in the Department's fiscal year 14 budget, there's included the implementation of co-payments for Medicare home health beneficiaries per MedPAC's recommendations. Um, the new co-pays on home health would be a tool to reduce overutilization and create savings for the program. Um, now, looking at ways to do uh, reducing the overutilization and create savings is something we all want to do. And uh, I do have some concerns, though, that with the proposals that ask beneficiaries to pay more out of pocket, particularly those who would be paying are probably a little more sick, more or less financially secure. And allied to that, I have concerns with asking seniors to pay more when there are strong indications of fraud and abuse in certain geographic areas of our country in the home health care industry. Because MedPAC's March report identified there are basically five big ones, five specific geographic areas where there is strong reason to believe that fraudulent billing practices are in play in the home health care industry. Uh, for example, um, it's a nice comparison. There are about 190,000 Medicare beneficiaries in my state, and there are about that many in Miami-Dade County. Uh, in Utah, with the same number of beneficiaries, we have about 100 home health care providers. In Miami-Dade County, it's nearly 700. The average benefit per beneficiary in Miami-Dade County is five or six times that's what it is in Utah. So. We have this situation where in a few geographic areas there seems to be some bad actors, if you will, and it strikes me that there's something wrong in places like Miami-Dade County. And so I guess my point, which I'm sure you understand, is in terms of looking for savings and efficiency, um, it seems to me we might be looking at situations where these geographic disparities uh, reflect that there may be some activities going on that aren't right. And I was wondering if you've looked at what your authority might be or using your authority to limit issuance of new provider numbers in these geographic regions which have strong indications of this type of overutilization? Well, Congressman, um, we are um, doing more than um, looking at recredentialing providers. We actually have, at the President's direction, uh, really ramped up our anti-fraud efforts around particular um, durable medical equipment uh, where there are very erratic billing patterns. Uh, home right. health is another high target. We recently have seen some mental health services and some pharmaceutical services. 
we have a very active strike task force, a heat task force, including U.S. attorneys and on the ground folks from our uh, Inspector General's office working together in Miami, Dade County, and in a number of other areas. They're not in Utah um, right now because we're not a, seeing that kind of billing practice. But fraud and abuse is something we're taking very seriously. We returned a historic um, returns to the Medicare Trust Fund and, in fact, to the Medicaid programs around our um, strike efforts, and which is why we're asking for new mandatory funding, right. frankly, because we're returning about $8 for every dollar that we're appropriated, and I think that's an incredibly important investment to make sure that people don't steal from these programs and that the services are delivered to people who want them and need them. Do you feel like you have the appropriate authority based on legislation to use data analysis and analytics to really target these areas that have uh, these Actually, problems. we have finally, for the first time, um, built over the last couple of years predictive modeling, yeah. the same kind of um, computer analysis that credit card companies and other banks have used for years. Medicare has never done that. Mm -hmm. So we are actually able not only to target areas where there are great billing irregularities, but actually target uh, the types of services and focus a lot of time and attention with our prosecutors, with our investigators, and our goal is to shut it down before it happens, not to continue to do the pay and chase, but actually to move right. in and shut down these operations. Are there any particular impediments you see in front of you that are limiting your ability to do this? Well, the biggest impediment is resources. Yeah. Ironically, the return is so great, yeah. and yet for the last number of years we have not gotten the appropriation even up to our budget limit. So I would just urge the committee, I think fraud and abuse is something that people agree on. We have a great track record. We can show you dollar for dollar what's going on, but our restrictions are really on resources. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana. <clears throat> Dr. Cassidy, five minutes for questions. Hey, thank you, Madam Secretary. As you know, we got five minutes. So if I seem like I'm speaking like an auctioneer, I am. And if you can, if I occasionally interrupt it, it is not to be rude, it is maximize our time. I start off with a couple of yes or no questions. In January 2012, the President announced plans to streamline government agencies like the Department of Commerce with this statement. Our economy has fundamentally changed, as has the world, but our government has not. Often it has grown more complex. He's also stated that he reports, uh, supports reforms to federal agencies that result in more efficiency, better service, and leaner government. Yes or no, do you believe the federal agencies should be mindful of our current economy and operate in ways that result in more efficiency? Yes. Uh, second, yes, no. The President's fiscal year 2014 budget proposal for HHS is $967 billion and seeks $80 billion in discretionary spending roughly $60 billion more than last request, yes or no, understanding the President's commitment to efficient government agencies and knowing the difficult budget situation our nation faces, could you accept a 2 percent reduction in your agency's total HHS request? No, sir. And if you, if you can't, can you defend all the expenditures in the agency as outlined in the President's budget, not even a 2 percent cut any place? I'm happy to do that uh, in a more robust conversation, but I think the five minutes probably won't allow that to happen. Okay. Well, thank you. I understand that, and I appreciate your sensitivity to the time. Uh, next, uh, following up on what Ms. Capp said, my state also is, uh, has a lot, lot of uninsured. Our governor has not yet indicated that he is going to accept the Medicaid expansion. It's going to cost our taxpayers $1.2 to $1.8 billion in state tax money to implement. So, but, but I'm a doc that takes care of the uninsured. The DISH program, as we know, has helped support care for those folks. If a state does not accept the Medicaid expansion, obviously there's concern that they would lose the DISH based upon a decrease in the national uninsured rate, although the uninsured rate within the state may still stay higher. We sent a letter to your office dated February the 11th uh, asking for a reply by March 1st. May have been a tight timeline, I apologize, but, but, but have really not received a, a reply since. Can I give you a clean copy of this letter and ask if you guys can respond to it? And I, I don't mean this as a got you, I mean it totally as a fellow who's advocating for his uninsured. Certainly. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, next, uh, oh my gosh, don't we all still have a heartbreak for the issue of mental illness in our nation? There was an article in the Wall Street Journal dated uh, from 2006, but apparently still apropos, um, death in the family regarding William Bruce. Uh, Mr. Bruce was hospitalized, with severe schizoaffective disorder, I believe. And there was a federally, uh, an agency that got federal dollars, protection and advocacy for individuals with mental illness, who according to the article, and I've been in communication with the father, they actually coached the young William as to how to give his answers to the providers that he could, he could get released. He did. The providers did not inform the family that he was still psychotic, and he went out and he murdered his mother. Incredible. I mean, now this agency, we've looked to see if they put in reforms to ensure that they are no longer doing this, have been unable to. I do see that they continue to receive $36 million a year. Can you provide us follow-up or some guarantee that the protection and advocacy for individuals with mental illness receiving $36 million a year in some way is no longer doing this? Well, Congressman, I have no idea what the agency is or does or what they advocate. I, I can tell you, though, that about 65 million Americans who currently have no mental health or substance abuse benefits, either through access to new marketplaces and new affordable health insurance or Medicaid expansion, will finally have yeah, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt. And that's and a, a big step forward. I don't mean to interrupt. And that, again, was not a got you question. And I didn't expect you to know that kind of micro level. But I think we all are concerned that this is not being funded by a federal government, or if it is, that there's some reform. So we will give you some information on that if you could reply, please. Uh, next, the president and now is the time plan to address gun violence. The president promised to do the following. Um, address unnecessary legal barriers, particularly relating to, uh, related to HIPAA, which may prevent states from making information available to background check systems. Uh, two, uh, releasing a letter to health care providers clarifying no federal law prohibits them from reporting threats of violence to law enforcement authorities. Uh, and three, starting a national dialogue on mental illness. Can you just give us an update of progress as regards these three things? Sure. The letter to providers went out uh, fairly immediately after um, the President's um, announcement of the package of administrative uh, initiatives that we were going to put in place, and I'd be happy to provide this committee with a copy of that letter, reminding providers that there actually is a duty to warn, and there are no HIPAA barriers against coming forward when somebody is uh, likely to um, be uh, dangerous to themselves or others. Secondly, we have just uh, put out an ANPRM, an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, um, that would ask the states to identify what they see as the barriers. Our frustration is we don't think there are barriers oh, to collecting the information that's requested. Uh, states have said that they see those barriers, so we want to know what they are so we can directly address them, and that has gone out this week, and we are in that dialogue. And within the next month or so, we intend to launch the national dialogue we already have are working with mayors and community groups in communities across this country. It will be a public-private partnership, privately funded community dialogues, um, toolkits by our office, uh, meetings in communities, but that dialogue will be a year-long effort to really bring mental health conditions out of the shadows, make it clear to people where they can go for help. If I can help you, please let me know. Thank Gentlemen's you. time's expired. Uh, Chair recognized gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for your time, and I commend you and the President for writing a budget proposal that, as a whole, puts our country's health system on the right path forward. Uh, my first question, I'm a strong supporter of the Affordable Care Act, and I look forward to the next few months to learn how it will be implemented across the country, especially in my home state of Texas. And I know you were there last year, and we talked briefly about this in one of your visits to our, one of our uh, level one trauma centers uh, in Houston. We've spoken about the importance of providing a robust exchange in te states like Texas that opt out of creating their own system. Our time today is so short, it's, uh, so it's not necessary to get, uh, get into it now, but in the next few days, I'd, could you or your office provide us in writing the status report on the creation of the implementation of the Texas State Exchange. Um, and again, you don't have a partner 
and but so we need to make sure and I know we're not the only state that's in that boat uh, we may be on Medicaid but not on that <laughs> we um, we would be glad to do that <laughs> okay my next question is something um, we haven't contacted you about uh, about the disproportionate share hospital payments it was recently brought to my attention that the, in an informal process the CMS changed their dish payment procedures to children's hospitals in certain instances. As I understand that children's hospitals using their dish payments reduced or having their dish payments reduced because of commercial insurance revenue is counted as Medicaid revenue. It's important to note that despite CMS continuing insisting that this is double dipping, it's my understanding that this happens even though the patients may be enrolled in Medicaid if their private insurance is paying the bills. Uh, there's no payment for Medicaid being made, and the children's hospitals never include these uh, children in their Medicaid cost reports in any way because they're n never considered Medicaid program patients. However, for some reason, CMS determined that these are Medicaid payments and reduces their dish payments. And are you familiar with the problem? Um, I, I am somewhat familiar, um, but would love to have a chance to get back to you okay. with specifics um, about... What I'd like to do is work with HHS to remedy the problem. And I've heard, and we have a great hospital uh, in our medical center, Texas Children's Hospital, and we have hospitals all over the country. Their children's and erroneous reductions would come close to eliminating their dish payments, and they do cover a lot of uninsured children who are not, uh, not in under Medicaid. In states like Texas, where Medicaid may not expand, dish is a critical revenue stream, and uh, so... Uh, TCH provides a valuable service to the, our community, and it should receive all the funding they're entitled to under the law, and this is an urgent issue, and I don't think it's the intent of HHS to harm our children's hospital. And we, it cuts across state lines. This is not a Texas-only problem. We would be um, very um, willing to follow up with you, um, Congressman. We, I think the issue that was um, trying to be addressed was in the dual eligible area if you double count what's happening but um, I'm I'm a little unclear how exactly that impacts okay. children and what's happening in the children's hospital okay. so we we'll get you some information I appreciate you. it uh, my next question is uh, is deals with sequestration and an effect on Part B drug payments for providers such as cancer clinics it's my understanding that because of the sequester and because of the way the underlying ASP is calculated to include prompt payment discount, many providers have been reimbursed less than the pay for the drug. Uh, Madam Secretary, does HHS have any flexibility if access to providers becomes an issue for beneficiaries to modify the payments so that providers are reimbursed at the rate that allows them to continue to offer those uh, drugs? We did not have any flexibility with the sequester implementation. And I understand that sequester was brought on by Congress and we're tasked with finding a way out. On this Part P drug matter, my colleagues, both Mr. Whitfield on our majority side and Mr. Gett and I have a bill that we've introduced for the last few sessions. This bill would exclude the prompt payment discount from the uh, ASP calculation. And, Mr. Chairman, I think we should seriously consider taking this bill up in our committee to mitigate the problems I've described. And, again, I'll yield back uh, 43 seconds to you. But Chair, thank thanks the gentleman. And now I recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for coming today. I appreciate you being here. And I want to talk about prevention funds in, in the budget or the use of prevention funds. And I, I've been to a dialysis center, and so you walk through, and it's not just the numbers of the money we're spending in dialysis centers, it's the lives. And, and most of that, a lot of that is preventable. So I'm talking about prevention funds. Most of that's preventable, so I'm for prevention. But we, last time you were here, we spoke specifically about using our prevention funds for lobbying a state local ordinances. I'm sorry, could I interrupt for one second? Dr. Cassidy, I have just learned that the, the rulemaking that I mentioned, it goes out tomorrow. So I just wanted to clarify, it isn't out the door yet, but it goes out tomorrow. I'm so sorry. Oh, no problem. Uh, the prevention funds we talked about last time, and, and I remember you saying that the, the examples I cited were state and local lobbying, so therefore it wasn't lobbying as, as, as prevented by the federal. So it was only limited to the federal government, which that actually wasn't accurate according to the law. The second thing was that you said that was the, the grants that I cited went out prior to the labor HHS rider in the appropriations bill. Therefore, it wasn't covered by the lobbying prevention. But actually, the um, US, eight, US 18 USC governed it as well. And we talked about that. And uh, your own regu internal regulation, AR-12, governs that. And, and so 
actually, when, after that exchange, I thought we would go and you would go back look at the programs and say, okay, these would be covered by those. And I was even interviewed. I don't have the transcript, but somebody asked me about the department. I said, I have all faith that, that they're going to go back and, and correct the way these grantees are behaving. I don't think they were behaving indirectly because they're, or incorrectly to themselves because their actual grant proposal stated exactly what they were doing. So I get that to get this. So I sent a letter and along with Congressman Whitfield, and the letter came back, and it, and it concerned me because it said the HHS staff has determined that they believe the activities are not lobbying. And what's frustrating about it, it appears it's like, okay, these groups were advocating for local and state policy. They put it in their, their grant requests. And let's find some interpretation of the law that allows them to do it. And, and, and the letter quoted a 1989 DOJ interpretation of 18 U.S. Code 1913 that was updated in 1992. So you have a 1989 interpretation of a law updated in 1992. And even your own AR-12 says any activity designed to influence action in regard to a particular piece of pending legislation would be considered lobbying. And it says federal, state, uh, federal or state levels are just uh, your support. So it just seems like we did bring this up and brought it to your attention and you said you would address it and it, we're back here now saying, well, that really didn't violate. We have an interpretation saying they can continue to go the way that they were going. And that was much frustrating for me because I thought we were going to be able to address that. Well, Congressman, I can tell you that CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, takes their, um, the rider that Congress added to the legislation and the provisions um, that govern the anti-lobbying seriously. They have revisited the grantees. They have put out new technical assistance. Um, they are proceeding to inform people as the money goes out the door. There's now language that goes with every grant mm -hmm. that a grantee has to sign, which reminds them about the um, prohibition to do lobbying at the state, local, or federal level. So we are trying to be very responsive to both the Congress direction and the original law. But it's not just. Uh but if you define, if you don't define what they're doing as lobbying, then they can they can continue to move forward. And that so like. There was one in South Carolina, you said, it said, uh, well, you didn't say, but the letter we got, the funded by the, there was a South Carolina one that was uh, noted as a violation. And it said they sent email message and scheduled press conference for purpose of gaining a city, a city ordinance. But there was one that wasn't. It was Nevada said they advocated for the passage of Senate Bill 27. And so we just want to make sure we understand that lobbying, according to the regulation, is any activity, not just if it's large scale or heavily funded, that's what the interpretation of 1989 says. And uh, I guess that's what was disappointing. We thought we were going to get that address. And when the letter that I received back, and, and I'm sure you have, is, is or we came to Chairman Upton. We're in recess. Is, was that that really didn't violate the spirit of the law, or the law at all. I don't know if it violated the spirit of the law or not, but the law. Well, again, I just, I think CDC takes those responsibilities seriously, and we're trying to make sure that grantees do too. And then the letter was about a year late coming back. I mean, a year at, not a year late, it was a year later. So it, just if we could, oversight would be better if we could do it more promptly. I appreciate that very much. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair, recognize the gentlelady from Virgin Islands, Dr. Christensen, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Madam Secretary. And let me just say before I ask my questions that the country is very fortunate to have you as secretary at this particular time, not only bringing your experience as governor, but as an insurance commissioner as we implement the Affordable Care Act. I'm going to try to ask my questions all at once in the interest of trying to get through my five minutes. Um, we have the first ever national strategy to eliminate health disparities, and we thank you for that. But it relies he um, heavily on the offices of minority health both the one in your office and in the other agencies. So what I'd like to know is how does your budget and how do your plans support um, strengthening the offices of minority health and supporting and funding those in the other agencies? The second one is on REACH. REACH has been widely documented as being extremely effective, the racial and ethnic um, approaches to community health. Uh, in eliminating or reducing health disparities. And I know that the department thinks that the community transformation grants and the communities putting prevention to work initiatives are good replacements, or that's what I understand uh, the department thinks. But 
Looking at the increasing health disparities in communities of color, I, I think that that requires some specific targeted um, attention. Um, and so we'd like to know what evidence the department has that supports that those would be good programs uh, to replace REACH, which we don't think they are. Um, there is a non-discrimination provision in the Affordable Care Act that we'd like to know when uh, the regulations for that would be issued. Um, two more. One concerning the Navigator program. Um, it, why does it only reimburse for recruiting for exchanges and not for enrollment in Medicaid? That's one question on that. And also there's a great concern that uh, organizations from inside the communities that are going to be um, approached uh, by the navigators are the ones that are, would be receiving the grants. We have experience with the Minority AIDS Initiative where um, organizations from outside communities came in and they don't have the trust of the community so we want to be assured of that. And the, the last one is how are we doing with the healthcare workforce? Um, as a physician, I'm particularly interested in physicians, but um, for example, it, it, the department projects that urologists would be facing a 32% deficiency um, in the number of providers needed in 2030. So that's OMH, REACH, Navigator Program, Adequacy of the wealth, Workforce, and Non-Discrimination Provisions. Well, Congressman, um, you know that I share your keen interest in not only documenting health disparities but closing them. I don't think there's any question that um, the full implementation of the Affordable Care Act with Medicaid expansion and affordable health insurance is probably the single biggest step we can take to addressing health disparities and so we're eager to work with you on that full implementation. Um, I know that there is a, a question about resource allocation to REACH and to other programs. Um, we have targeted the community transformation projects in areas where there are large numbers of um, health disparities. That's part of the criteria for doing this and actually uh, in a better budget time I think we'd fund everything but we had to pick and choose and make some um, decisions going forward but again I think the combination of of the implementation and the specific community projects aimed at communities of color and the national HIV AIDS strategy which again is targeting for the first time resources to those most in need have great potential for moving forward. Health homes around chronic conditions is another area I think that isn't looked at as health disparities but will actually impact communities of color significantly. We share your concern about navigators coming from the community, being of the community, and that will be part of the criteria looked at as those funding proposals come in. And you will see in the 2014 budget um, requests for resources, particularly in HRSA, but also now with the uh, mental health professionals to not only enhance workforce, nurse practitioners, um, physicians assistants, uh, more National Health Service Corps folks, but also 5,000 mental health workers, which are part of the President's Now is the Time agenda. So we are keeping a keen eye on workforce issues. Chair, thanks to the gentlelady. Now I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary, for being here. In an address to the Democrat National Committee in September 2012, you stated, first, if you already have insurance you'd like, you can keep it. Madam Secretary, I hear from constituents every week lamenting the fact that they have lost or at risk of losing their employer health insurance plan that they like because of Obamacare. And here's the dilemma that, that many business folks are being put into. A, a constituent of mine called me, sat down with his accountants and his experts and his medical people, and what they said to him was, you have three choices. The business that you've owned for 33 years, that you started out with small and started growing and growing, you have 59 employees. So here are your choices. You pay the $43,000 fine. You close down the third shift that's the least profitable of your three shifts. You just get rid of that, and then you don't have to do anything. Or you pay even more than the 43000 to insure all of your employees. Now, 
most of his employees are already covered, or a large number of his employees he already pays for, and he pays for them in full. And he's struggling with these dilemmas, knowing that some of his people won't be able to afford the insurance that he's already paying for if he drops it completely. And he has not made a decision. But that's the dilemma that businessmen and women across the United States are having to go through. And again at the DNC, you said, but for us Democrats, Obamacare is a badge of honor because no matter who you are, what stage of life you're in, this law is a good thing. And I have to ask you, can you really believe that to the 7,000 employees who are part-time employees for the Commonwealth of Virginia who are facing a cutback in the number of hours that they have because the Commonwealth has decided based on trying to make sure that they keep their costs in control, that they're not going to allow the part-time employees to have more than 29 hours. Do you really believe that to those people it's a badge of honor or that Obamacare is a good thing? Because now their hours are going to be cut. Yes or no? Well, sir, I don't like anybody's hours to be cut. We need yes, to actually make sure that people get paid and work to take care but of their you families. Do understand but health costs are part of that uh, overall I have to, payment. I have to move on because I only have a limited, limited amount of time. But the examples go on. In my district, we have a county with County Virginia. They hire retired law enforcement folks to work court security as court security employees. Now, many of these people already have insurance. They're usually retired, or, or a lot of them are. They have insurance or they have Medicare. Now the county is going to have to cut back their hours because they don't want to have to pick up insurance for people who already have insurance. And so they're going to have to cut back their hours. And for many of these folks, that translates into a 30% pay cut for these retirees. I don't believe that's a good thing. And I'll take your previous answer as the answer to that question as well, that you hate to see that happen, but sometimes things happen. And do you really believe that the 28-year male, old male whose premiums will skyrocket next year, do you think he thinks that Obamacare is a good thing? And how about my 82? I've got to keep going because my time's running out. How about my 82-year-old mother enrolled in, Medicare, in a Medicare Advantage program, which is a highly popular program, which has been cut to pay for the ACA? Can you really believe, deep down in your heart, can you really believe that she thinks Obamacare is a good thing? The good news, your mother is paying less now than she did. I don't know about your mother's plan, but Medicare Advantage plans are down 10 percent. Enrollment is up almost 20 percent. So your mother actually is well, in better got, shape than she was before yeah. the Affordable Care Act. Well, and she passed. also got a lot of her stuff done. When she saw this coming down the pike, she said, anything that I know is wrong with me now, I'm getting it fixed. Uh, and how about Susan Surface, the 42-year-old single mother who was recently diagnosed with leukemia and turned away from enrollment in the high-risk high pool program because the ACA-established fund was depleted? I can't believe that she thinks that Obamacare is a good thing. Madam if Secretary, repeal had gone forward, there would be no pre-existing and, and what I would have to say, plan Madam, is, is that for so many of these folks who are facing uncertainty as to what's going to happen, who may not be able to pay the employers who like to pay for their uh, long-term employees, who may not be able to afford to do that, they don't think Obamacare is a good thing. They don't see it as a badge of honor. I have to tell you, Madam Secretary, and I know we disagree on this, but from when I, when I talk to my constituents, it appears to me that thinking that Obamacare is a good thing and is a badge of honor is just wrong thinking. And in fact, I believe it's going to make a majority of Americans losers in the health care arena. Mr. Chairman, I thank you so much for the opportunity, and I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome. Uh, I want to thank you, Secretary Sebelius, because, and, and the President and your team here, because what this budget does, it stays true to American families, especially our parents and grandparents that stay on Medicare. This is very interesting what my colleague has raised because what we know about the Republican budget that was passed is their plan for Medicare is to turn it into a voucher. That doesn't save anybody money. Uh, it, it simply shifts cost to the beneficiary, probably including the family members of my colleagues. Uh, and what it will do over time is really a, force Medicare to wither on the vine. Uh, meanwhile, the contrast here with President Obama's budget is it, again, strengthens Medicare, lengthens the life of the Medicare Trust Fund, uh, and does so in a smart way, it's something that we've all discussed, and that is by moving from a fee-for-service system that has proven wasteful to a new value-based system. Did you all know that 10 percent of Medicare beneficiaries now are involved in these value-based 
coordinated care models that are saving significant money. These are many, on many times voluntary efforts by doctors and hospitals and health systems uh, that have realized now that the way we deliver health care in America has to change. So that's the good news out of this budget. Sure, you can pick on certain circumstances, and with the implementation of the ACA, there are a lot of challenges ahead. But we would do better by working together to make it happen for our families, to lengthen the life of the Medicare Trust and not turn it into a voucher. That is the Republican vision. And we haven't even started on Medicaid, because under the Republican budget for Medicaid, they, in essence, break the promise to our older neighbors and our parents and grandparents Medi what Medicaid means to me, I think of my neighbors down the street that are able to stay out of a nursing home because Medicaid has been there for them. Or that when they had, at the end of their life, they had to rely on skilled nursing. They could go there. But under the Republican budget, in contrast to this one before us, the Republicans, in essence, take that safety net away entirely. I mean, have you looked at the numbers of the Republican budget cuts when it comes to Medicaid? So you, I'm sorry, you kind of... Um, I sat through budget hearings a few weeks ago, and it was very apparent to me. So I'm sorry, Madam Secretary, to uh, take up time that I wanted to ask questions on that. But there is a very important contrast in the visions of this, for this country, for our older neighbors. And uh, if it's not apparent after looking at these budgets, then you all really need to do some study. Uh, Madam Secretary, I, I want to change the subject a little bit, because another piece of good news in this budget is a new innovative proposal that I think holds great promise for this country. Uh, and that is the new innovative plan for brain research, the collaboration with our academic institutions, uh, the NIH, the private sector on brain research. This is an ambitious project that is necessary and important to develop the tools now as we for confront greater diagnosis of Alzheimer's, uh, mental illness and others. Could you give us an outline of how this uh, collaborative effort will work and your vision uh, for the coming years here? Well, Congresswoman, I share your enthusiasm for um, this new frontier and Dr. Collins, who um, is the head of the National Institutes of Health, has um, enthusiastically put together this plan with colleagues in, in the academic sector and the private sector, feeling that um, it's, it's very much like the human genome project that um, we need to map the brain, we need to understand uh, what's happening and what's not happening, and that will lead a much faster pathway to uh, cures and identification of how to deal with everything from Alzheimer's to autism uh, and, as you say, various parts of mental illness. So there are certainly some federal government um, new resources. There are also private partners in foundations stepping up, academic researchers, and we put together what Dr. Collins describes as sort of the dream team, some of the foremost authorities at universities across this country who are going to be leading this initiative and effort. Also our colleagues at the Department of Defense are very much involved because it, um, brain injury is one of the most significant impacts from the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, returning warriors are often suffering from everything from post-traumatic stress syndrome to issues around the brain. So understanding what's going on and having ways to effectively deal with that, I think, help our entire country. Okay, the gentleman's time's expired. Now I recognize the uh, gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Bilirakis, or Florida, for, Florida. Mr. Bilirakis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, I'm receiving uh, calls, increasing amount of calls uh, and correspondence from my constituents who are concerned about the, what to expect come 2014 with regard to the ACA. Many are certain that the law means higher costs, increased taxes, and less jobs. As a matter of fact, I have a tweet here from uh, at uh, the Kip Wilson. She wants to know why middle-class workers are going to be subject to increased premiums and more taxes under Obamacare. I keep hearing that. Uh, yesterday, in your testimony before the uh, Senate Finance Committee, your responses left one of the law's leading architects to conclude the implementation of this law might be, quote, a train wreck. I must tell you, that leaves me, my constituents, and the American taxpayers with even less confidence 
that we had before the law was uh, passed, and which, uh, which, uh, w I guess it's beginning. Uh, we're going to launch it October first. Secretary Sabigas, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the questions raised yesterday by the Senate colleagues. Uh, with thousands of pages and regulations issued, hundreds written, uh, of new Washington acronyms and uncertainty mounting, can the department share a written timeline and impl impl implementation with this committee to the American people uh, so they can better understand what the administration's intent is and what they can re expect? If you can uh, elaborate on that, I'd appreciate it. Yes, sir. Um, what I said yesterday and uh, here today and will continue to say is starting October 1st in every state in the country, new marketplaces will be available for open enrollment. Some of those will be federal marketplaces uh, but contain private market plans, choices, and competition. Um, and uh, some are going to be run by the states in advance of that, hopefully this summer. There will be individuals trained uh, to answer questions and do outreach so people can become aware of uh, what's developing and the choices they can make for themselves and their family. There is an up and running website with a very clear timeline, healthcare.gov, which gives uh, steps along the way. Uh, we will have uh, open enrollment by October 1st, where people by website or uh, on paper can pre-enroll in plans that will be up and running on January 1st, 2014 in every state in the country. Now, what about, uh, again, uh, the tweet that I, I just received at the Kip uh, Wilson? Uh, are we going to be subject to increased premiums and higher taxes under Obamacare? Well, the insurers right now, um, Congressman, are just beginning to file their planned rates for the new marketplaces. Uh, there is then a negotiation period either at the state level or with um, the federal marketplaces about what those rates are. So I think it is any description of what people will be paying, I think, is, is just um, invented at this point. The rates are not filed. They are not certain. And we are very confident that um, not from our standpoint, but from the Congressional Budget Office analysis that the combination of competition, elimination of a lot of the overhead costs, and uh, subsidies available to a lot of these Americans who for the first time will have full insurance coverage, uh, they will be looking at um, a much more competitive rate and lower prices than they're paying right now if they have insurance coverage. So you don't anticipate increased premiums under Obamacare? I do not anticipate the kind of rate shock that people are describing. And okay. again, there are no rates filed. So anyone who is giving quotes about what rates will be paid is just really inventing that. Thank you, Madam Sec Secretary. Uh, next question. Uh, According to the reports, HHS believes it has the authority to shift money from certain accounts to fund any remaining expenses related to implementation of the new health care law, specifically from any non-reoccurring expense fund. Yes or no, do you believe you have such authority to shift funds between HHS accounts to cover expenses related to implementation of the health care law? Yes or no, please. Um, I do it have legal transfer authority that is part of, um, and it is limited. The non-recurring non -recurring expense fund is a specific fund that Congress established within the Department of Health and Human Services that is for one-time IT costs. So those are two different things. Can you please uh, provide a list of the authorized accounts you believe you have the ability to use uh, to make such transfers for implementation purposes and accounting or what funds have been transferred or used for such pro, uh, pro purposes and also the legal analysis for such authority. Yes, Can you please uh, provide, provide that for, yes. for me? The Thank gentleman's you time much. has Appreciate expired. Uh, we are voting on the floor. We have uh, eight minutes plus before uh, the vote ends. I would like to ask the members if they could uh, be as concise as possible. Everybody can then ask a, a question or two. Um, and the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engels, recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Secretary, I, I, I've watched you in the years you've been Secretary. You've done an outstanding job, and your testimony here today just continues it. So thank you very much for the job you're doing. Um, 
I'm from New York, and many New York hospitals are working hard to uh, uh, move towards more effective, efficient systems by participating in ACOs and bundled payment programs. Um, the, re the reality is these reforms are going to take many years to fully implement. In the meantime, I think there needs to be a recognition uh, that uh, of other f uh, funding streams such as GMA DISH or bad debt payments are essential for hospitals investing in delivery system reform. Uh, hospitals need these various funding streams to treat those who will remain uninsured even after the ACA and train our next generation of physicians. And of course, in New York, we train a lot of physicians. So to face the significant cuts year after year adds another layer of uncertainty to a rapidly evolving but challenging health care system for our hospitals. So, Madam Secretary, what is HHS doing to help ensure our nation's hospitals have the resources, stability, and flexibility they need for the coverage expansions included in the ACA, as well as move toward providing higher quality, more coordinated uh, care? Well, we're working very closely with hospital leaders across the country uh, who are key healthcare leaders, and I think what's incredibly impressive is the amount of transformative care underway, trying to get to a um, higher quality of care for every patient and deliver it at an affordable cost. I think it's also very good news that the President has nominated Marilyn Tavner, who not only was uh, a practicing nurse but ran um, uh, hospital systems and is very closely attuned to the needs and uh, economics of hospital care moving forward. She's been nominated to be the administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and we're hoping that she will be confirmed shortly. Thank you. Let me ask you one other quick question, then I'll yield back some of my time, as the chairman asked. Um, I was very pleased with this administration's efforts uh, to develop and implement a national HIV AIDS strategy. Uh, it's a road ma map to help us reach the point when new HIV infections are rare, and when they do occur, every person has access to high-quality uh, uh, treatment. We make strides forward, but with approximately 50,000 new HIV infections each year, we still have a long way to go. Um, as a member of this committee and as ranking member on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, um, I have had the opportunity to work on legislation that's made significant impact in the fight against HIV and AIDS. The President's budget recognizes the critical role played by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in preventing new HIV infections and monitoring the epidemic and also directs vital uh, treatment funding provided through the Ryan White program. So can you share with us how we're moving forward with the national HIV AIDS strategy and how the strategy is reflected in the President's budget priorities? Um, I think the President shares your uh, commitment and concern and also the opportunity to really um, look forward to an AIDS-free generation in the future. So we're doing um, important research at NIH. We'll continue and be um, part of the funding that NIH will hopefully receive through the allocations in the budget. We, the CDC work not only in communities uh, throughout the United States, but internationally has been hugely impactful and effective, and I think we certainly intend to continue that. And we have um, regathered resources and focus them on communities most at risk, where the infection rate is the highest, where the transmission is still underway in an attempt to stop uh, transmission, um, uh, cut down on the number of new infections, and really focus on communities that need not only initial testing but connection to treatment. And the Affordable Care Act, again, offers a huge step forward for a lot of patients right now who have been diagnosed and determined but do not have insurance coverage to uh, move forward with ongoing treatment. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Chair, yield back. Thanks, gentlemen. Yields back 27 seconds. <laughs> Chair, and I might say I've just notified that uh, Mr. Griffith's mother just tweeted that her Medicare Advantage rates were just increased. <laughs> okay.
<laughs> Just to continue well, I can conversation. give her a list of plans that Chair. she could look for in open enrollment that have gone down. Chair, recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Elmers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, Secretary Sebelius, thank you for being here. And I have a lot of questions for you, so I'm going to blow through this as quickly as possible. So if you can answer with a yes or no, that would be very, very helpful because I am being respectful of my colleagues. Um, number one, on April 5th, the federal court issued a ruling requiring that it is that the morning after pill or plan B pill um, can be available for all people of all ages, including young adolescents. Do you plan to repeal this ruling, yes or no? Yes or, isn't no. It, yes or no, I have no jurisdiction over a federal judge. Okay, no jurisdiction. So you do not plan to approach this in any way? The Justice Department is currently evaluating an appeal. Okay, they're evaluating an appeal at this time, the Justice Department. Yes, that is okay, not our thank jurisdiction. You. I would like to move on. Um, you know, there again, I'm Obamacare. I'm to answer your question. No, I appreciate that, but I only have so many minutes. Um, now, I, there again, reaching out, the idea of the ACA. I have um, a, a constituent back home who just contact my, contacted my office two days ago. He has 200 employees. He cannot afford to provide health care for them at this time. He knows that he is going to be hit with a $2,000 per person penalty. He basically is saying, look, 80% of my employees are minority. I will have to lay off 60 employees just to be able to deal with the penalty itself. Um, in, in doing some research, doing some homework here, 61% increase in, in um, insurance rates in North Carolina, 60, 61%. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, um, for a, a family, $5,600 for a, an insurance pl plan with a 20% increase as a result of the ACA. Um, I, my staff has done some research as well. For a plan, for a family of four, the cost would be $271 per month with a $25,000 deductible. That is unbelievable. My question to you, ma'am, because you, you have talked about this um, ACA creating a thriving middle class, helping create jobs. Does this, what I just laid out to you, create a thriving middle class? Yes or no? There are no rates filed in the new market. As it so is I right have no now. idea so what, what you're, you're saying quoting. is, is that there the, are no the, rates. The cost, the there cost is of no implementation. Would, the cost of insurance would drop that drastically for a family. Ma'am, all I'm telling you is I have no idea what rates you're quoting, but that is not an effect of the Affordable Kaiser Care Family Act. Foundation. Kaiser Family Foundation. Okay. quoting what's happening okay, let's, right now let's in the move market on. in let's North move Carolina. On. Um, I also had my staff reach out to the, um, as you stated it, a one-stop shop website. Basically, incredibly uh, non-user friendly, categorizes Medicaid for the poor, under 26, co-op plans, there is no one standard plan to compare anything to. How can anyone plan for the future? Employees, individuals, how can anyone plan for the future? I know you keep citing the 2014 date. However, we live in real time. Americans are scared. And in real time, insurers are currently filing rates. Insurers are currently making their plans to come okay, into the let, market. Okay, let's we move on. I have, a, I have a minute and 30 seconds. Um, to the, the issue of the 2% sequester, there was an OMB memo that went out to federal agencies about the cuts asking that life, safety, and health be, of Americans be protected. Now, it, it is my um, understanding, I, I believe I heard you say that CMS has absolutely no ability to act on this, no ability to address the 2% cut. That's yes or no? As it is right now. Yes, because, that is correct. Okay. The reason that I'm asking is because right now, as you know, there are cancer patients who are being turned away from community cancer centers who need their chemotherapy if they have Medicare. Is that correct? And you did, I did hear your ways and means testimony, and you said that right now there are patients who are being turned away. Part of the sequester was a 2% across the board cut for every division of CMS, every program, every category. That's what was implemented by the United States. Okay. Congress. And it affects physicians who are giving life-saving treatments to patients, correct? Because it, atta because it attacks the Part B. 
yes or no? Two percent cut is in effect because of sequester. Yes, ma'am. Well, I, I'd like you to um, know that I have a piece of legislation, H.R. 1416, that addresses this issue. There are families in crisis right now who have received an incredible, devastating piece of information. However, I would like to further this by saying that the President's budget actually increases that formula decreases payment and reimbursement to those physicians by another 1%, makes it an ASP plus, ASP plus 3% rather than the 4.3%. Are you aware of this? I am aware of it, but the way the President's budget would be implemented is that there would be far more flexibility, which we did not have in the sequester, to actually... And what, by flexibility, are you referring to the fact that the manufacturers would be required to provide the rebate as directed by the Secretary? Is that the flexibility we're talking about? No, we're talking about the ability to administer the administrative costs differently than the cost of the drug. The important thing is to get the So you the have that jurisdiction, but you do not have jurisdiction to The intervene. way the sequester bill was written, Congresswoman, we were told to cut across the board every program, every category, 2% for Medicare, and that's what Even though did. the OMB directed to protect life, safety, OMB and directives don't overrule Congress, and the, you the passed the bill that implements you. I, 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 I apologize for interrupting. The, the time has run out on the floor. We're going to try to wrap this up. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. Um, thank you, Madam Secretary. I think you're doing a terrific job. Uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Um, we're, we've run out of time all over the place on the floor in this committee. You have to leave, I know. Um, we had a hearing the other day with some representatives from the business community, and what became clear is um, until the issue of whether implementation of, of uh, the Affordable Care Act was going to go through was settled by the outcome of the election, there were, I think, many uh, small businesses around the country that, frankly, um, I can understand this, didn't really take the time to learn the rules and regulations and what was coming down because they didn't know whether it would be in place. What's happening, I think, is as they focus in on something about which they got a lot of misinformation over time, they're discovering to their relief that there really is a lot of support there for small businesses. And many of us um, were motivated uh, to support the Affordable Care Act because of what the relief we thought it would bring to small businesses across the country. Um, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to make a suggestion. I think it would be terrific, and I'm sure the, the department's working on this, um, to sort of put together, you know, the, the 1040 easy version of what benefits are now going to be available to small businesses um, out there because they're primed now to be looking for that information. And if I think if we provide them with accurate information about these opportunities, it will come as a relief to them, um, and they can really um, – kind of invest in the opportunity that it presents. So I hope the department is working on something um, like that that we can turn around and share with our constituents and small businesses across the country. We are working on it. We'd be glad to provide it to you. And we're doing presentations with the colleagues in the Small Business Administration across this country. So we're happy to do any number of things. But you're absolutely right. I think a lot of the misinformation, once it's corrected and people understand what the rules are and what's going to be available to small business owners who often are paying 15 to 20 percent more for insurance right now, they are very pleased about what opportunities they may have. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. I've been notified the uh, leaders holding the vote for us. We'll have one follow-up, Dr. Burgess. Thank you for staying with us, Madam Secretary. Director Gingrey brought up the issue of contingencies. Um, Gary Cohen, in addressing the AHIP Foundation a couple of weeks ago, brought up the issue of contingency. So you indicated this morning in your test, when your answer to that, Dr. Gingrey's question, there are no contingency plans. And yet there is discussion that I'm aware of of people talking about actually narrowing the scope of the ACA. It's called descoping. So are you in your department talking about descoping or narrowing the scope of ACA no, provisions? Or are you talking about workaround plans? No, we are not. We are um, moving ahead. We have the federal hub on track and on time. Um, we are moving ahead with the marketplaces that we will be individually responsible for, and we're working very closely with our state partners on their plans and their timetable for the state-based marketplaces. 
So the federal hub will be available? Yes. Unless it's not. And if it's not, you have no contingency plans. At this point, our energy and resources are focused on getting it up and running, and we are on track, and the contracts have been led, and we're monitoring it every step along the way. Now, let me just say that if uh, the promise is that you will be ready and you are not, I think the United States Congress, which does hold the ability to fund things at the federal agencies, would have to look seriously about putting any other money into that exercise. You've had three years and billions of dollars if you are not ready, I think the Congress needs to hold your agency accountable. Well, I appreciate that, Congressman. I think that the CBO analysis when the bill was passed was that we'd need about $10 billion in implementation money. $1 billion was appropriated. I can tell you we are on track. We've judiciously used those resources, and we intend to be open for open enrollment around the country October 1st. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thanks, uh, Chair. Thanks, gentlemen. And thank you, Madam Secretary, for your time. Uh, as we move closer to implementation and enrollment in the exchanges, uh, could you please agree to come before the committee again before October 1st? Uh, we'll make every effort. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We appreciate your, uh, your information, your testimony today. Uh, members have additional questions. <clears throat> I'll ask them to respond. Uh, ask them to submit the questions, and we'll send them to you immediately. We ask that you please respond uh, promptly to the questions. Members should submit their questions by the close of business on Thursday, May the 2nd. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Uh, you've been very uh, generous with your time. Without objection, subcommittee is adjourned.